those who know that enough is enough will always have enough. That is the Zen koan that inspired our opening credit music, composition of mine, Enough is Enough. And it's an apt thing for this week, Thanksgiving. Give thanks for what you have, even if you've experienced loss, and to give thanks for the abundance that we exist in living in America. So I want to clear up some um, things in terms of class logistics. We'll be discussing the preferred answers to the midterm next week. Uh, part of that will be pre-recorded, first 40 minutes or so, because I have to help hire a, I'm in a hire, search committee where we're hiring a second command, in command for the college, so um, part of the exercises end at 3.30, so I need to be there for that, so be pre-recording uh, the first half of both days of next week, and then be here live for the rest of it. Um, so we'll be discussing the preferred answers to the midterm next week. This is week nine, short week because it's Thanksgiving. Next week is week 10 when the final goes out. Uh, and you basically are supposed to have it in by close of business uh, the following Thursday, which would be the actual finals week, second week of December. So, otherwise, uh, despite what Moodle might say, you don't have an F. Um, the midterm is worth 50 points, as this is stated in the syllabus. And as I stated before, there is 25 points worth of extra credit built in. Hence, on the paper midterm and on the online midterm, it says 75 points. Um, basically... Measure your grade in the class, assuming that you have turned, because it's all about points with the class. So if you turned it in, you got full credit for it. No matter when you turned it in, try not to abuse that. Some of you still haven't turned in the, into, in the midterm. If I didn't build a penalty in the syllabus, I'm not going to penalize you now, but... Uh, you could potentially have an F in the class if you haven't turned in the midterm. In fact, just so you know, for grading purposes, if you haven't turned in the midterm by now, then probably you'll get an incomplete or worse. Basically, the way I approach it at grading time, no midterm, one or two assignments, it's an F. Because, you know, you can't necessarily push this limit too far. It's already loose. So, so, say you got a 47 on the midterms. Not out of 75, it's out of 50. That's still 80% if you double it, or actually closer to 90%, 94%. That's still A territory. Any score above 50 is A territory. Don't care what Moodle says. It's not, I haven't fixed the programming that says that you got an F. That's not what the actual grade is. It's just an artifact of the program, which I haven't fooled around with. All right, other class logistics. I wanted to mention uh, I do have uh, physically your uh, papers back uh, on this convenient little box up here on the podium. So one of the things I noticed in your give it up exercises, I don't generally encourage you to give up your meds. And I think I tried to say that. Like, for example, one person mentioned an amphetamine, which uh, lots of folks are being treated with amphetamine class drugs for their ADHD or whatever. This particular person mentioned giving up dexedrine, which is, you know, a low, less potent amphetamine than Adderall. Uh, Adderall being a pharmaceutical methamphetamine, dexedrine actually essentially being at the lower end of the potency scale. They used it in diet pills. In fact... Many prescription, uh, let, me, let me reverse that. Many over-the-counter drugs are in prescription strength, strength by simply doubling them. So Dexatrim, things like that, those diet pills, basically the way amphetamines work is they suppress appetite 
by putting your body on red alert. Uh, if, for example, this particular mentioned, you know, the, the uh, withdrawal effects, it's normal withdrawal effect. So they felt more tired, not taking dexedrim. They have experienced increased appetite. That's also true. Uh, increased anxiety because they mentioned that while they were on dexedrim, they didn't have to take the anxiety meds. Well, the reason is, is because the amphetamine by itself can decrease anxiety by itself because you're too stimulated to feel anxiety, but that can also wear off because as you know with uh, meth heads and speed freaks, they can become extremely paranoid, which is essentially uh, anxiety to the extreme. So the same thing with giving up sugar, caffeine, high fructose, fructose corn syrup, you essentially experience normal withdrawal symptoms from those particular things, essentially underlying what I said, that there are all kinds of addictive drugs and some of them are legally and they're legal and some of them are fed to you. Continue our discussion about memes uh, because this is the class that I basically mm, uh, really go into detail about that because I want to spread the concept around. So this is from a book uh, by Brody, Viruses of the Mind, who Brody was or is, was a Microsoft billionaire, uh, was part of the original company with Bill Gates back in the day, made a billion, is now retired or doing other stuff, wrote a book called Viruses of the Mind. And within his book, he, this isn't in the original work that uh, Dawkins did, but it is itself a meme. So he's breaking memes into um, three broad categories. So there's a distinction meme, which is a category or label. So you know, graphically, I've kind of broken that down into the little virus floral thing, a spiral, and also um, a hypercube. Uh, so it's a distinction, categories, geometric shapes, biological shapes, things like that. S distinction memes, strategy memes, which are often break down into situational cause and effect beliefs. For, and they often brought break down into a type of logic like, if this happens, then this is what you do. So for example, a strategy meme for driving. Red light, making a right turn, and the state laws allow it. Stop, that's then turn. That's actually the letter of the law. Actually, in Oregon, which is a weird place for driving for somebody like me from LA, you can actually make a, turn, a left turn onto a one-way street or turn onto a one-way street even when the light's red if the traffic allows it, which in California you can't do that. But Oregon's weird that way. So red light, coming to a red light, right turn, stop, then turn. That's the letter of the law. Four-way stop, wait for all cars ahead, then go. Traffic circles, go counterclockwise. If you see a cop, slow down, Drive casually, right? These are strategy memes. So in, within driving, you can see variations of that, like, uh, for example, where I'm from and what Oregon cops here call the California glide, where you come to a stop sign or a red light, you don't come to a full stop. You just kind of glide at five miles an hour and make your right turn. Uh, again, illegal, but you know, it's a strategy meme. If you don't see a cop around, then that's what you do. If you do see a cop, then you drive towards the letter of the law, right? In addiction, there are strategy memes because an addiction is a goal-oriented behavior. So the strategy meme within addiction is, I am, not, I am inadequate, I am not enough, I am unable to have an impact on my world or control my impulses or feelings. Feelings are dangerous, avoid them. Externals give me what I lack. So that um, you might think and not, think, not think of it as an ethnic slur, but to call alcohol Dutch courage basically dates back to a time when Anglos basically looked down upon other European immigrants and Dutch courage is, well, the Dutch don't have real courage. They have to get drunk to have courage. So Dutch courage. So 
using that phrase, I'm not acknowledging, I'm acknowledging that the meme for that distinction, an ethnic um, uh, group, that's a category meme and also a strategy meme where you're using alcohol as a tool for dealing with feelings of being able to be social, to deal with your feelings, to get rid of the anxiety, and using other drugs that are external to your inner world. So in other words, when we say pills are not skills, the pills reinforce the illusion that you don't have the inner skills to handle whatever you're taking the pill for. So for example, within the dexedrine, you actually do have, because it's a low level amphetamine, you do have the capability of dealing with life and focusing without the drug, but you've gotten used to using the drug. So you're under a doctor's care, so okay. Uh, that uh, could lead uh, to problem, other problems and other aspects of your life, or definitely leads to problems with uh, other folks. So with an addiction, the memes of basically being inadequate, I'm not enough, then you have to be enhanced chemically. So those are some of the core memes within addiction. Association meme. So basically it links two or more memes together. A smell of wind on water. So for example, if you're at the ocean and a sea breeze, or if you're at a lake, sea breeze, or you know, standing next to a snowfield, the smell of the wind off of that. Uh, sunlight, uh, the sunlight on grass, whether you just mow it, that smell, uh, or off on sand or rock or skin. The association of a flag, whatever flag it is, American flag, Confederate flag, the military, uh, American, winner, the best. So these association memes, which link two or more, are often used in advertising. So mom, apple pie. I mean, so you know the phrase, and you know how this works. You know, mom, apple pie, baseball, those are all hot dogs. Those are all uniquely American. Chevrolet, you know, like a rock. You know, all, look at all these advertising memes that happen in commercials and the associations that they have with them. So by Brody using this model, he's essentially, you know, saying, look, this is, if you, once you understand what's being done to you, you can basically unpack the meme. All right, so if you go back to slide, if you would. So sexy women, sex is often used to sell toothpaste, computers, cars, sexy women, beer, computers, cars, technology. Uh, this is an old meme, but basically, you know, they don't, I don't know if they use Joe Camel anymore, but Joe Camel, Spuds McKenzie, all these mascots and things like that used to sell alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, um, you know, the elephants with the COPD ads, the hole in the uh, Abilify ad, you know, that's taking notes with a woman who is in depression and the, the hole is her depression, so her depression's always with her in little cartoon ad selling this particular prescription drug. So Joe Camel, symbolizing youth rebellion and smoking. Basically, that's a meme going back to the early days of advertising, particularly in the 50s. James Dean, Levi's, you know, uh, white t-shirts and youth, you know, smoking with hot rod cars, et cetera, et cetera. And then health memes, good hygiene, safe sex, safer sex, proper diet, rest and exercise. Those, they're all concepts for what those are. So these are all examples of memes that enter our lives. And so Brody, by making this model of saying there are different types of memes, so it isn't just a virus of the mind that replicates, that it's all, there's also different types of memes so that you can, which is in itself a meme, uh, then you can basically look, examine memes and kind of take them apart and understand, oh, this is what's being done to me. I bought into that. And maybe I should change that thinking pattern. So William S. Burroughs once uh, wrote, language is a virus. <laughs> okay? So as you can see, language is itself a, vi a carrier for memes because of its seminal viral nature, nature as complex recursive instructions and knowledge storage. So 
to break that down, yeah, I am speaking English. So to break that down, seminal comes from the same root word. It basically has to do with seeds, right? Its original viral nature as a complex that is not simple, layered, recursive, meaning it repeats and loops back on itself, complex recursive instructions and knowledge storage. It carries meaning, and the meaning is historical. Okay? It's vibrational, so language is vibrational, so it transmits everything that vibrates, so light, sound, thought, magnetism, and other forces. So in other words, language, the spoken word, is basically a way of carrying memes so that it not only resonates, but illuminates. It also creates and generates thoughts and reflects thoughts, magnetism, and also attracts like thoughts to it. So when I talked about earlier about memes, that memes accrete, that is, they gather together and attract other memes with them so that they become viral ideas. So, for example, if we talk about what does it mean to be patriotis patriotism and what does it mean to be patriotic, those are all memes that have specific ideas and specific meanings. So, in whatever patterns, so it's vibrational, transmits everything that vibrates. In whatever patterns the perceiver can perceive and, of course, those they cannot. So, you might not be able to see the memes at work, but the idea is within the uh, categories that Brody has talk, spoken about, that is to say, distinction, strategy, association, and then you can see how memes are often used in advertising. The association memes are used in advertising. Health memes are used to counter what happens in advertising. So basically, people are acting out Scripts. In fact, talking about it as a script is basically using theater. All the world's a stage. I mean, that goes back to Shakespeare. And the men and women are just players. So if you're actually working in a play, you have a script. You have directions. You have all these different things. That's simply a meme or a metaphor, also a trope, a syllogism. All those are examples of memes because when you think about how people act them out, they may or may not be conscious of what's going on, but you can become conscious of what's going on. So, in whatever patterns the perceiver can perceive, and of course, those they cannot perceive. So, part of that, so we've talked about before, logic is a means to reason to an answer. The answer doesn't have to be true, just has to be an answer that seems true within that particular logic system. For example, we talked about last week the Constitution, all men are created equal, and within that meme, white men are superior to all others. Where they don't say it as baldly as that is in the Constitution, but that's essentially what the meaning is, right? So is it true, and does the language it's framed in support the conclusion based on, say, the dictionary, right? So is it true? And then who is doing the defining? So there is, uh, so what I'm showing you is a, a meme for what we call in my field and in political science and in ethnic studies, deconstruction. So we're basically saying that all knowledge that occurs within an academic setting has a history and has a, not only a history, but a strategy. And it's a meme. So, for example, then in terms of deconstruction, we're basically taking the meme apart to see its component parts to see if, oh, see how the logic is put together. And is the logic true or you're acting on it as if it's true? So who's doing the defining? Okay, so in the dictionary, from a certain point of view, the dictionary is considered the neutral arbiter of culture. 
right? Look it up in the dictionary. And it's, you know, it's not good or bad, it's just the facts, right? So it's neutral. It's not taking a position. The word is in use. This is its meaning. Now, my favorite dictionary, and there are several, but I use the American Heritage Dictionary, not because it's particularly accurate, but I believe that it is representative of the reality America likes to portray. American heritage. Why would you question that, right? It's like mom, apple pie, Chevrolet, <laughs> like a rock. Right? You rely on it. So who is doing the defining? Right? So there's an African proverb, the hero is the teller of the tale. It is not the same as winners write the history. Okay? Because it's basically saying, yeah, well, winners write the history. Well, does that mean that we question the history that they write? Maybe, maybe not. But the hero is the teller of the tale. I mean, do we think about the losers and the loser's point of view? Like, is it represented? Do we even try to discover it? Hmm. You know, Columbus discovered America. Well, were there people here before then? Oh, yeah, the Indians. Okay, which Indians? Uh, that's not in the story. Yeah, who's, to who's telling the story? Hmm, why isn't it in the story? Right? So the African proverb, the hero is the teller of the tale, basically, basically means one of three things. One, whoever is telling the story tells the story from their point of view. Two, each telling of the story, they make their role more important and anybody else's point of view less important. Three, knowing one and two, you now know, okay, there's something missing and maybe I should look for whoever else was there. So if you apply that to winners write the history, oh, Columbus discovered America on October 12, 1492. Uh, okay, where was he? Uh, he was on an island. Okay, what was the island from the natives' point of view? And oh, who were the natives? Oh, the Taino Nation. Do they still exist? Well, the dictionary says they're extinct. Wait, did the Taino write that dictionary? Because the Taino say they ain't extinct. <laughs> I, I'm not making this up. This is like real. I've really found this in the American Heritage Dictionary, right? Even though the Taino have several words that you use in the course of uh, living, like, you know, summer comes, you hang out in a hammock. That's a Taino word. You go canoeing. That's a Taino word. You have barbecue, a Taino word. Iguana, cassava, hurricane. Those are all Taino words. So wait, how are they extinct if we're still using words in their language? There's a dictionary that says it's Spanish, which the Spanish say, well, not actually Spanish, it's Taino, but okay. So Columbus discovered, Columbus made first contact we talk about it from the Taino point of view. Columbus made first contact with the Taino nation on Guanahani Island. Okay, the Spanish called San Salvador, Guanahani Island, on October 12, 1492, which the Taino, that's not the Taino's calendar, but that's what we know, right? The Taino's, one of their islands is Boracan, which is known as Puerto Rico. Right? So, language is a virus. So I've basically unpacked the meme of, of kind of like American history. So the idea, all my relations, which is basically uh, Mashika Tawe, which is in Aztec, Matakwi Asin, which is Lakota, Chai, which is in uh, Carowina, 
all my relations is not the same as we the people, because we the people is only talking about we the people from the point of view of the Constitution is wealthy white men who are the only ones who can vote. We the people for Native Americans doesn't just mean all human beings without restriction, but also anything that is sentient, which could also be the earth, it could be trees, it could be animals, it could be rocks, it could be stars, it could be all kinds of things, that, things you can't see, like the ancestors and unborn children. Those are our relatives as well. It's a different point of view on which to build a representative democracy, because who's representing the unborn children? That we have to take into account. That's why we don't clear-cut forests, because they're not our forests. Well, we don't even believe in real estate, because you can only own something you made. You didn't make the land. You didn't plant the forests originally. So we can't clear cut the forests because they're not our forests. They're our great, great grandchildren's forests. We have to ask them. And if we are going to cut it down, then we can't cut all of them down. We can just cut them down enough to build a building that's going to be standing when they get there. Hence the longhouses, right? So we the people is not the same as all my relations. So within, that's what I was talking about in terms of recursive meaning, language is a virus. There's, you have to be able to unpack the meaning and know it. This is the American Heritage Dictionary. Now you can see, this is a lesson that I was taught as a child, which is the same lesson which if you look at Spike Lee's movie Malcolm X, this is the same thing that Bain in the Malcolm X movie is teaching to the young Malcolm. Now, Bain is actually a composite character. So he's illustrating what we refer to in axiological studies as dichotomous logic. It's a logic that, is ba that Western English is based on. Dichotomous, two. Positive, negative, good, bad, male, female, up, down, etc. It's higher, lower, richer, poorer, etc. So you take naturally occurring dichotomies that are supposed to be equal, and you see if they're actually equal within the language. Now, when I said the meme of the dictionary, because the dictionary is a carrier of memes because it compiles language, the meme of the dictionary is supposed to be neutral, but check this out. So naturally occurring dichotomies. Man, this is the American Heritage Dictionary. An adult male human being. A human be oh, so man, hmm, okay. An adult male human being. Two, a human being regardless of sex or age. Three, the human race, mankind. In zoology, a number, member of the genus Homo, family Homidae, order of primates, class Mammalia, characterized by erect posture and opposable thumb, especially a member of the only extant species uh, Distinguish, homo sapiens, distinguished by the ability to communicate by means of organized speech and to record information in a variety of symbolic systems. So, for example, what it's saying is that to be human is to write and to have language. Now, we can, all make, a, we can make a case for all humans having language. Not all humans use writings, but they do mostly use language. A number five, a male human being endowed with qualities such as courage, strength, and fortitude considered characteristic of man, manhood. In theology and Christianity and Judaism, a being composed of a body, a soul, or spirit, informal, a husband, a lover, or sweetheart, workers as opposed to management, enlisted servicemen, et cetera, et cetera. So... Strength, courage, and fortitude, a manly man. Okay? American Heritage Dictionary, and so on. Woman. <laughs> woman collectively, an adult female human being, women collectively, womankind, woman is wise, feminine quality or aspect, womanliness, brought out the woman in me, a maid servant, a mistress, paramour, informal, a wife. Etc., etc., womanhood, the state of being a woman, womanish, characteristic of a woman, woman like, effeminate, and weak. I like how mistress comes before wife. 
Aha, yeah. Aha, yeah. Okay, American Heritage Dictionary, right? Ah, huh. yeah, interesting. Now, I'm not exhibiting brand loyalty here. I'm just showing you that you go to Webster's, you go to any other dictionary, they're going to be organized pretty much the same. What, what I like about this one, and this is my standard of reference for dictionaries, is they'll give you the origin where it came from. This is Middle English, right, for example, all right? Right, wife is, yeah, a wife, my woman, uh, yeah, right, okay. So here you have, okay, so man is strong, courage, woman is effeminate and weak, so, okay, mistress, right, so it's sex, it's, yeah, okay, huh, so, wait, here, the dictionary is the neutral arbiter of culture, it ain't semen so neutral, Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Like the newspapers and yeah. Okay. So the meme is this deconstruction. Look how it's put together. So they may use these words that are neutral, but they have a history. Oh, yeah. And the history has baggage, and it's still there. So white. An achromatic color of maximum lightness, the complement or antagonist of black. So it's either a complement or it's against it, right? So the other extreme of the neutral gray series, although typically response to maximum stimulation, white appears always to depend on contrast, the white or nearly white part of something, the albumen of an egg, the white part of an eyeball, a blank unprinted area, one that is white or is mostly white. Uh, let's see, a... White breed of animal, a caucasoid, often white, a politically ultra-conservative person being of the color white, approaching color white, uh, four, having the comparatively pale complexion typical of caucasoids, of or pertaining to characteristic of or dominated by Caucasians, slang, fair, generous, decent, that was very white of you. Now, when I first read this, wait, that's a Richard Pryor line, and it's not a compliment. <laughs> Fair, generous, and decent, and it was, that was mighty white of you, <laughs> right? That was what, he, what Richard said, so that was very white of you. No. Fair, generous, and decent. Fair, generous, and decent. Not written or planted upon, unsullied, pure, mantled in snow, ultra-conservative, reactionary, white collar, of or pertaining to workers salaried or professional whose work usually does not involve manual labor and who are expected to dress with some degree of formality. White lie, a diplomatic or well-intentioned untruth. White list, a list of persons or organizations considered worthy of approval or of acceptance as opposed to blacklist. White livered, cowardly. White magic, magic or incantation as practice for good purposes or as a counter to evil. White man's burden, the supposed responsibilities of the white peoples to govern the non-white peoples of the world. From the white man's... I appreciate that they use the word supposed. Yes. I it, find it really interesting that they use antagonist uh -huh. instead of any other uh -huh. adjective. Uh-huh. To go against compliment. So part of the piece with this is then when you go to, you know where I'm going with this, obviously, because I'd already set it up. Look at contrast. Look at the dictionary. It's a meme. Black. So being of the darkest achromatic visual value, producing or reflecting comparatively little light and having no predominant hue, having little or no light, a black moonless night, Often black, so notice there's no complement or antagonist here. Right. Uh, often black belonging to an ethnic group having dark skin, especially negroid, dark in color, a face black with anger, soiled as from soot, dirty, evil, wicked, black deeds, cheerless and depressing, gloomy black thoughts, marked by anger or sullenness, gave him a black look. Often black, attended with dis disaster, calamitous, the stock market crash on Black Friday, 
deserving of, indicating, or incurring censure or dishonor. Man has written one of his blackest records as a destroyer of the oceanic islands, wearing black clothing, the black night, served without milk or cream, black coffee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then I didn't even go into, so often black, a member of a Negroid people, Negro, um, let's see. There's a whole section about black list, black market, black, you know, anyway. Uh, Blackamore, I left at the bottom. A dark-skinned person, especially an, Ameri an African Negro, black plus more, Blackamore. Like yeah. Yes, right. And or green with envy. Look. Yeah. A black look. Yeah, I've never heard a black look yeah. in my life. Right. And then censure and dishonor. Uh -huh. it's, it's pretty interesting because apparently white is like the greatest color ever and everything positive can be associated with it is and then black is just terrible. Yes. I, I don't think I heard one positive thing in that entire day. Well, we're coming up on Black Friday after Thanksgiving, right? Right. <laughs> Which is supposed to be the day that, all right, merchants make up for the rest of the year because they were operating in the red and it's supposed to be the great, greatest month. And it's black on an accounting leisure, right. so you're, it's profitable, right? Right. So part, of, so part of the meme, and this is one of the things that we do in drug treatment or I try and teach in drug treatment, is listen to people, the way people talk about themselves or the ideas that they have to begin to unpack some of the historical baggage that they may or may not know they have because it's programmed right into the language. And also, when you look at a cultural product, like the dictionary, because it's a cultural product, you can get the worldview that they're, well, look, this is the American Heritage Dictionary. You can make a case for this being the American Heritage. There we go. Middle English and Old English there. All right. So when we talk about then mimetic engineering, which I kind of began to introduce last week, the idea that we are running on different memes. There are memes about our drug use. There are memes about our identity. There are memes, memes about our concepts. And if we were going to change them, how would we do that? So. Mimetic engineering, taking the idea from genetic engineering, is basically taking, since it's, memes are transmitted through any cultural mode of communication, and they combine to form viral ideas, which can mutate over time or given in diverse environments. Mimetic engineering is taking healthy memes, splicing them onto a disabled lethal meme, and injecting them into a host. It could be propaganda or it could be education. Okay, so as an example, um, that last piece, the very bottom, Blackamore. Now, you might not have heard that unless you had read classical literature or history, all right? So that term, it's a dark-skinned person, especially an African Negro, right? So this is coming from Old English or Old Europe. So that word was used to describe Joseph Haydn. In a biography of Beethoven, who was, his, who was Haydn's student. And they were basically citing an incident. So when I talk about in my ethnic studies class about Afro-Europeans, I'm using basically the same language. Oh, I'm an African-American. Oh, yeah, I'm of African descent, but I haven't, you know, other than going to Africa two years ago, you know, nobody's been, made a trip back to the motherland since for generations since we were brought over on the boat, right? But I was raised to know that, okay, there were, we weren't just slaves. There were, you know, there was a black woman sitting on the throne of England. 
of the time they were slaves. That uh, you know, George III's wife was one of these Afro-Europeans who was a black, a German princess of African descent, right? So you don't get to be German royalty and be an African princess. You have to come from a European power and be of color. Shakespeare, Othello the Moor, okay? A black African who is leading a mercenary army in Venice when Venice was a city state. Shakespeare's writing fiction, but the fiction has to be believable. Therefore, there actually have to be people there that actually are doing that. And there were. That's why Othello the Moor. So Haydn basically produced a piece of music for an Austrian prince, Esterhazy, for his birthday. And he asked it for the composer to come out. And Haydn shows up and he says, what, this music is by this blackamoor? What's your name? Joseph Haydn. Oh, well, henceforth thou art in my service. And so the author basically said, oh, everybody knows the incident at Kiss Martin. That's where he's talking about, you know, where he's playing music for Esterhazy. And he basically says that Beethoven had even more of the moor in his features than his teacher Haydn. So wait, Beethoven's black too? Wait, this white guy is saying that Beethoven is black? Uh, yeah, they weren't tripping. <laughs> uh, there is, um, I just checked out a book from the library about um, uh, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who was considered uh, the other Mozart or the black Mozart. He was also a master swordsman kicked it with Alexander Dumas' father, the general. They were both, he was one of his swordplay teachers because his mother was a slave, his father was a nobleman, and once you're in France, you're free. Even though he he's, was born, his mother was, he was born on a island, French island, just like Dumas' father, just like the French author Alexander Dumas. Who, if you see pictures of him, he's got an afro because his father's a black general under, among others, Napoleon. And the stories that he's writing in The Three Musketeers are about his father, who actually held a bridge by himself, shot at sword point for 45 minutes until reinforcements came. So, yeah. <laughs> Chevalier St. George was one of his friends. So... Okay, Afro-Europeans, right? So Blackamoor, it's the idea that, okay, the model of when people are talking about race mixing, uh, well, race is a concept, but okay, black, if black is inferior, well, then how do you explain people like Beethoven, Haydn, you know, the Chevalier, Queen Charlotte, so George III's wife, the George that we fought the Revolutionary War against. They had 15 kids. I guess he wasn't tripping. <laughs> okay, I mean, she spoke seven languages, played the harpsichord, had music composed in her name, had flowers named after her, you know, like the bird of paradise is named after Charlotte. Uh, so again, people had different ideas about the product of interracial marriages and they didn't trip back then. But Americans tripped. Because there's a meme for that. So, hence, the idea about mimetic engineering, right? You could take a negative and turn it into a positive, or you could basically tell a different story. And say, oh, well, this isn't a bad thing. Look, Obama is, how black, is Obama black enough, or is he too black, or, you know, where, would he, we have this problem... If Hillary Clinton was president and all of a sudden they are trying to do all the same stuff. Hmm, maybe not. <laughs> all right, so the idea with mimetic engineering, taking healthy memes, splicing them into a disabled lethal meme and injecting them into the host. So, for example, in medicine, uh, they use an anti-cystic fibrosis gene grafted into a disabled cold virus. So... How this works, cystic fibrosis is basically a lung disease that uh, where your lungs essentially lose their elasticity and it becomes, you become unable to breathe. 
cold viruses are targeted specifically to lung tissue. So what you do is you take a cold virus, take out its DNA, graft in a anti-cystic fibrosis gene, the cold virus coat is already primed to go to lung tissue. And it's already designed to replicate itself. So, boom. That's, you know, in terms of gene therapy, and they were looking at doing that with other things. So, when I first developed this idea in terms of looking at in social medicine, if you will, redirecting gang activity using pro-social memes. So, gang activity was the original application that I used for it, which they still think I'm crazy for, but whatever. You know, but it's also useful in drug treatment because you're trying to redirect people's image of who they are and what they're doing. Memes and genetic, okay, so each of us has memes that we use to construct and act out an identity. Sometimes these remain unconscious, sometimes they're chosen unconsciously. So in treatment, what we want to do is choose them consciously or at least have you become aware of your memes so you can basically redirect them. So when I first read that dictionary, I mean, I was basically taught those that to basically deconstruct the dictionary using those dichotomies and realizing, okay, well, black isn't negative to me. White isn't necessarily negative or positive to me, but I noticed that these are the memes that people work out, you know. I believe in having women leaders and women warriors, so I don't think about it, uh, women as being effeminate and weak or whatever, so, okay but I can realize that people get socialized to do that. Okay, so becoming aware of your history, your culture, your science, your religious beliefs, and how they become political policy. Where politics, the meme with politics is that it's the science of power. Who has it? Who doesn't? Those dictionary definitions do not support the idea of women being in power or being strong. Or, if they are going to be strong, being strong in the way that a man is strong. Or a white man is strong, or whatever. Okay, so, before 1492, and the memes basically before 1492 have been largely erased, not totally, There was neither class, race, or sexism on this continent, no illegal aliens, no poor people, no real estate, multiple types of marriages and religious tolerance. We had complex urban civilizations with democracies that existed, well, definitely before 1492 and definitely as late as 1100. And I'm not talking about the pyramid cities, but of course I'm talking about the pyramid cities too. Because in order to build a pyramid, you have to have agriculture, mathematics, since they're aligned with the stars, you have to have astronomy, you have to have metallurgy to cut the pyramids. And don't tell me space aliens, I'm not really buying that. So it's not impossible. But when I say political policy, so this whole thing against same-sex marriage is like, okay, this is basically imposing a particular type of religious belief, i.e. Christianity, on everybody else. Same thing with not having a woman president. Again, that, you know, is what I refer to and I will refer to it in this particular term. Okay. So our identities were shaped to achieve those social ends, and the societies were, we were shaped to socialize individuals to achieve those ends. Starting with the dictionary, which even, you know, when you're a kid, you learn vocabulary words, and the dictionary is only used to learn, teach you how to spell, but not necessarily how to deconstruct the history or the meaning. 
which is not supposed to be even a skill until, what, college, maybe, maybe? So after 1492, and I'm reacting to um, this conference that I just had presented at, where I heard this really cool term which kind of really capitalized it for me, settler colonial patriarchy. That is, European immigrants to this continent, and they're, they're basically believing their culture was superior, and also Christian nationalism. Now, Christian nationalism is basically saying, okay, America's a Christian nation, even though the founding fathers did not say that. But the meme has spread as if it's true and is being used as if it's true. But here's Christian nationalism. The idea started in Europe with papal bulls, and so we know this in terms of Indian law. So the reason I'm going this in introduction to addictive behavior is not only did these ideas form in 15th century Europe, but our ideas about alcohol did as well, and tobacco as well. We did not use the indigenous models of alcohol or tobacco that were in existence before 1492. We're not using those, those policies. Okay? Drug technology is a meme. What you do with drug technology is a meme. So I've talked about this before. If we were basically working off of the Irish and Scots wise woman model, nobody makes whiskey until everybody has bread first. Nobody. If we were working off of the Native American alcohol model, nobody who is an adult has access to alcohol, particularly if you're pregnant, particularly if you're a little kid, and you won't drink, you will not absolutely drink to intoxication. You will not get drunk, period. If you're Aztec, under pain of death. Well, wasn't it just for their parties and stuff like that? Drink? Religious ceremonies. Period, and not to intoxication. What we would call a very light buzz. Okay, therefore, no drunk driving, no domestic abuse, no, none of that stuff. Well, first of all, you, you couldn't beat your wife in Indian country because your wife could be like a clan mother or the daughter of a clan mother. You could be kicked out of the tribe or worse. Not always worse, but it wouldn't occur to you to do that. So Christian nationalism works like this. The papal bull of 1493, note the date. Pope in Rome, and this is basically when the Catholic Church was the church, the power. Pope in Rome says, any Christian who discovers, this is the, also the doctrine of discovery. Any Christian who discovers non-Christian land. So this is at a time when Christianity was considered whites only. There were Asian parts of the church. There were African parts of the church. They weren't considered in this equation at all. Any Christian, so this means a white Christian, white European Christian who discovers non-Christian lands can claim those lands for all of Christendom. And the people who live there lose title to the land forever, even if they convert to Christianity. Well, why am I quoting a 1493 papal bull? It's because in the 1800s, mid-1800s, a U.S. Supreme Court decision, Johnson v. McIntosh, was deciding a land claim between two white men, Johnson and McIntosh, and cited that papal bull in their decision. Who owns the land? 
the guy that got it from the Indians or the guy who went to the land office, the real estate office, and bought it? He just, they, the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice wrote, wrote the opinion, the guy who brought it from the land office, it's his land, because the Indians lost it because they had been discovered. And he said, this is not the moral decision, but using the principle of stare decisis, that is, we will let the decision stand, and the only court reference we can find is the papal bull of 1493, and he cited it in the decision. Basically, this is not the moral thing to do, he said, because if the moral thing would be for all the Europeans to leave America, and we ain't going to do that. So the land goes to the guy who bought it at the real estate office. So this is the legal principle of Indian law in terms of land. Oh, you got discovered, you don't have the land anymore. This is the legal principle that also, that how we got Alaska from the Russians who didn't even land in Alaska. They sold the rights to Alaska to America. Now the Haida and the Tlingit, the people who make the totem poles, uh, they're a military power that basically went from Alaska down into California, their trading empire. Salmon streams the whole bit. They're a military power. You don't mess with them. The, the Russians didn't even make landfall. So I'm talking about this meme of Christian nationalism. I mean, it's in full effect. It ain't just an idea. It is a legal principle, right? In terms of, oh, well, you're not Christian. You lose the land. Uh, okay. Really? Is that Jesus saying that? Because, nope. nope. All right. All right. So we experience, started experiencing changes such that rights of indigenous, including the equality of women, non-white ethnicities, non-Christian beliefs began to be violently suppressed until what we have is what's considered normal. Oh, no same-sex marriage? Wait, it was here before y'all got here. Uh, why are you tripping? Wait, why does your religion get to decide what's normal for everybody else? Huh. Well, it's between a man, a man and a woman. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so what we have, what's considered normal today, is an addictive society with multiple inequalities. So... What happens often in treatment is we don't necessarily do this kind of deconstruction, but you are cursed with me. So, some of us feel this should be resisted militantly because it was imposed militantly. But there are other ways to resist it, including... Um, Concepts such as satyagraha, which is basically literally means Sanskrit means grasping and holding on to truth. It's the way of Gandhi, Howard Thurman, uh, Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, host of others. I don't mean to just say the dudes know this, but in South Africa as well. Okay, yeah, we have the military option, but we're going to basically do this nonviolently. So when we talk about maroonage, basically that's the kind of the idea. That's one meme. And I'm basically showing this as a meme of identity that's constructed. You can construct other ones. So I'm basically showing how part of, in terms of the design of the class, mimetic dissemination, you know, putting that together. How do the forces of Western civilization work? And looking at mixing uh, traditions that are indigenous here to... Uh, an analysis that's not necessarily indigenous here, but since I grew up here, it's now indigenous, right? So the idea of Turtle Island, North, Central, and South America, one country, the long-reaching land, and uh, what's referred to in Africa, the circuit of the world, Atalanta, same continent. And al -Kabulan. So that's basically forging uh, what I call an Afro African indigenous, African indigenous uh, identity using different role models throughout history. 
and also current to that are specific models in terms of looking at, okay, how do you mix culture? How do you mix tradition? How do you mix basically resisting? And Yeshua was part of, Isho, who you know by his Greek name, Jesus, is part of that tradition. And some contemporary folks, too. So that's a constructed identity, really. Or you could say made up, basically to resist. What does that look like? So yes, I have weapons, but not guns, ideas, memes. So part of that is looking at how, when we talk about a creating a movement that the class, I, I, I guess I did, meant, I did talk about being prevention guerrilla. So if you're going to make a transformative movement that's coming from people who are looking at their own addiction issues. So these are three memes for cross-cultural transmission. Assimilation, acculturation, and what I call the viral mimetic paradigm, which since I never heard anybody use it before, I'm assuming that I invented it in the 80s. So they used to talk about the melting pot. And the image was that it's basically an industrial uh, smelting um, image where basically you put in raw ore, you apply the flame, the ore melts, the impurities come to the top, you skim that out, and you pour that into mainstream America, right? So in other words, the flame of freedom of oppor and opportunity in America gets put into a common culture that is the melting pot, and what gets poured out is the mainstream, okay? So when George Bush talked about mainstream American values, he's talking about, like, Iowa, <laughs> not Harlem, <laughs> yeah, let's not even go there. But I mean, okay, when they talk about mainstream values, I mean, who who are they talking about? What what is mainstream, right? Not the common folk, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, right. It's often not the common folk. So it, uh, basically, it didn't matter that that meme came from a Jewish immigrant in a play that he wrote to describe the European immigrant experience, his experience. You know, the opportunities that we could experience in America that we couldn't experience in Europe. Well, that's fine for him, right? But some of us don't melt. And by the way, what about Native Americans? Where are they in the mainstream, right? I mean, okay. It's not in that, it's not in that story. It gets left out. So some people around the late 60s, 70s, uh, 80s somewhat talked about the salad bowl idea. So whether... It's a fruit salad, like they talk about in Hawaii, or a regular green salad. You can have different kinds of lettuce, different kinds of tomatoes. Carrots remain carrots. Beets remain beets. You can have cucumbers, et cetera, et cetera. They all retain their identity. And the common um, thing that holds them together is the fact that they're in the salad and that they use salad dressing unites them all. Beets can rub off in carrots or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it was kinder, gentler than mainstream but it didn't necessarily explain hybrids because it didn't really kind of glossed over that, right? But it was a little less toxic than mainstream you know, because we weren't forced to assimilate. So assimilation means like this. Assimilation and culturation, the reason that we talk about them in addictions, in the addictions field is we basically feel within the addictions field that acculturation is better than assimilation, culturally speaking. Right? So in anthropology, which is where those words came from, they're used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. So if I eat a carrot, I assimilate it. It comes out the other end not looking like a carrot anymore, but I've absorbed all the nutrients. Okay? In a culture, so if that, culturally what that means is in order to be American, I have to erase what I was before I became an American and 
assimilate in, you know, speak the king's English better than the king, know the king's history better than the king, you know, not speak with any kind of accent or anything like that at all. Acculturation. Which fork is the salad fork? The fork that I use. <laughs> but if you're at a formal play setting, you're actually supposed to know. Basically, you start from the outside and you work your way in, right? Separate fork for the bread, separate fork for dessert. Separate knife for dessert, right? Water glass, wine glass. You know, when do you put on your... When and where do you put on your napkin, all that kind of stuff, right? Formal European-style dining, American dining, right? So acculturation is knowing which fork is a salad fork or how to use chopsticks, where and when to belch. Do you belch at table? What cultural context? Is it considered an insult if you don't belch at table? Etc. Acculturation means you take on cultural artifacts and practices but you retain your own culture. So the reason I'm talking about culture is that in addictions treatment, we found that there is a culture of addiction. There are many things within mainstream America that support a culture of tradition that traditional folks from cultures outside of America don't have. And that if they retain elements of their non-addictive traditional culture, they're protected from substance abuse. So it becomes really critical. And so a lot of those folks, and this is coming from the meme of, that, of the dictionary, white people are not allowed to have an ethnic culture from that worldview, which is a problem, because <laughs> it's a lie. White people have a culture, and it's, not, and it's older than America, too. And it was non-addictive before America, too. And they're not allowed to have that. <laughs> so, you can't make money off of that. Right, you can't make money off of that, right? So, acculturation. Right? You keep your cultural artifacts, and you bring in other cultures as necessary for the situation. Chopsticks, salad forks, so I use eating, but there's other things too. Could be language, it could be terminology. All right? The viral mimetic paradigm. So this is basically you have to understand what a meme is and how they work. And so when you do that, okay, those cultural mimetic paradigms. So assimilation. This is straight from the anthro data. Erasing an emic culture in favor of an etic one, usually by conquest. So an emic culture is the culture that you had within your own folks before you got conquered. And then you had to take on an etic one. That is the culture of the conquerors. Western anthropology took the etic position up until about World War II. Oh, let's go study these primitive cultures. Let's civilize them. And if you remember when we were talking about food mood, the whole Weston Price thing where he basically said, uh, yeah, these people didn't have teeth decay until they started eating like us. And as soon as they stopped eating like us, their problems disappeared. Hmm, imagine that. Why are we civilizing them again? All right, so Western anthropology usually took the etic position. That is, it studied other cultures without studying its own culture. Oh, we study. You can't study us. This, and th there was a shift that happened right around World War II, particularly with Michel Foucault. Right, right. Well, that tradition actually came from Europe, but Americans embraced it wholeheartedly. Right. I'm not certain that that is the reason that's overt, but it could be an effect. So one of the things you have to think about in terms of memes 
If you think of about them as an infection, just like when you get a cold or a flu, you're kind of delirious when you have a fever from a viral infection. Not all infections give you inflammation. They might give you a particular delusion. A meme might do that without necessarily seeming to be lethal. It gives you a point of view that may or may not be accurate. But it seems to be consistent because it's supported by logic that, oh, well, this is normal to do this. Yeah. Acculturation, taking on cultural artifacts and practices without erasing your own. So if we're going to look at this in terms of addictive behavior, okay, well, maybe I can't be a 12-stepper, but maybe I can try abstinence. If not abstinence, some harm reduction. I mean, working with a client like that now, look, don't binge drink before Thanksgiving. <laughs> or during Thanksgiving. Right you know? Next. Yeah. Well, if you start the pattern before, you may be able to carry it through, but... So melting pot, easy assimilation, salad bowl, and the viral mimetic transmission. So memes are transmitted versus media or contact. They mutate or adapt to the environment the host is in. Including the host. The host is not only an environment, but the host is an environment. So usually what's imitated is the stuff that's most obvious. So again, this is why, you know, when I was basically trying to apply the, well, well, not trying, applying this to gang behavior. Why are white kids pretending that they're black rappers? There's something about the culture that's attracted to them. They say that there's a level of truth telling that they're not finding in the mainstream. It's appealing, appealing to them. And they don't have a tradition of questioning authority other than being teenagers, which then tends to be consumerist, not radical, political radical. Though those of us who were political ra radicals in high school and middle school, different framework. So for example, so Hopi is a Native American nation or tribe. It's a culture that arose under specific survival conditions and beliefs. The external beliefs are the ones that are emulatable or copyable by non-Hopi culture. White culture, for example, doesn't believe in reincarnation. The part of Hopi prophecy which holds natives reincarnated as whites, reincarnated as whites is not likely to be believed within white culture. The hippies simply become a way for whites to emulate the external values of native culture and protest to the values of white culture. Okay, it's two mimetic ways of seeing, and one of which is true. So within that idea, so let's see, Hopi, hippie, I think, no, that's not it. Yeah, Hopi, Hippie, was that here? So, well, L.A. Crips and Bloods, it works the same way. Up on the top is the original meme, then how it got replicated in Tonga and Samoa, non-urban environments, and then Eugene, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, white wannabes, as it, they were described years ago, and how they've changed. Yeah. The original meme, they were both radical responses to mainstream suppression that were community organizing attempts on the street. So Crips has an acronym, Community Revolution in Progress. Bloods, Brotherly Love Overriding Oppression Defending Society. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, their organizing core came out of the Black Panthers and the US organization in LA. So they're both cultural nationalists, both political, both doing different stuff. And then the meme got corrupted into a street gang. While those organizations were in existence, there weren't really street gangs. So part of the idea, so the idea then uh, is that if we were going to look at the memes of how you deal with addiction and also how you deal with thanksgiving to give thanks is to basically look at the philosophy of, of enough is enough don't overeat eat to just enough you can basically avoid many of the problems that are associated with addiction which are basically overeating over drinking etc so next week, uh, first half of the class will be pre-recorded, of both classes will be pre-recorded, and I will do, come in live for the last half, and we'll go over the midterm. Actually, we've got all that here. So got your papers, and we'll see you next week for the brand new show. You can. It's already recorded.